。What you're about to experience is one man's quest to see beyond the tumultuous period we're in, and to envision what lies just beyond our grasp, yet well within our reach. Welcome to Larry Rifkin's America Trends, where the future has arrived, and it's just in time. Welcome back to America Trends with John Kropsik and Larry Rifkin. And uh, John, I'm so excited about the podcast that we've been doing of late because I really think we're breaking uh, new ground, important ground, and we're looking just beyond the horizon at a lot of subjects that are on people's minds, but not necessarily always on the front page. Though I will say this issue of immigration does end up on the front page. Oh my God, too much. But, but in a very twisted, <laughs> contorted way. And we unfortunately don't get a lot of information from people who know a whole lot about it. And I will say that the gentleman that we're bringing to our audience today, Alfredo Corchado, is a giant. Now, here's a guy who has looked at the drug trade. He's done prize-winning reporting about it. He's got a new book called Homelands, where he's looking at uh, issues facing Mexico and the United States, immigration. He was born in Mexico, John. His family moved to California to join his father picking fruit alongside him in the fields of San Joaquin Valley. And uh, his new home, he said, was a far cry from the small town in Mexico. But he's really got incredible perspective on this issue. Yeah, as I remember, this he's got a very good perspective on this. And we really need to hear from people who are on the front lines like this. So I think this is an important podcast to to bring to, to, the, to the people. Well, the book is called Homelands, Four Friends, Two Countries, and the Fate of the Great Mexican-American Migration. And folks... Let us get this understood. Mexico is going to stay where Mexico is. America is going to stay where America is. We are going to own a border together. We are going to share a lot of cultural influences back and forth in the Southwest. I mean, let's be honest. This wasn't always American territory. It was Mexican. So we have to understand that we are going to live together. We're going to have to figure this out. And these politicians on both sides who try to take advantage of this issue really are not doing us all much service because they got us into a situation we should never be in because they each were either exploiting or expelling people for 30 years, using it to their political advantage. Absolutely. And I'll be honest with you, John, I'm sick of it. I really am. Uh, oh, me too. And uh, you know what? And I, we really should demand Congress because they're the people who make the laws of this land deal with this problem because you know we've we've gone on this has gone on for too many years and and it's time we dealt with it yeah as adults as adults and right. we need labor we need to have the richness of this culture uh it's something that is so obvious to so many and americans want an immigration deal john every study that i have seen and there was a great article in the wall street journal by William Galston, and we have had him on our radio program. One poll shows that 73% favor comprehensive reform, but Congress twiddles its thumbs. I'm sick of it, I'm tired of it, and I want to hear from somebody who knows a whole lot more about it than the people who've been feeding us all this nonsense for a long time. So, Alfredo Corchado on Mexico, the U.S., and Homelands, today on America Trends. The book is called Homelands, Four Friends, Two Countries, and the Fate of the Great Mexican-American Migration. Our guest is Alfredo Corchado. And Alfredo, I've got to ask you, you were born in Mexico. Then your family moved to California. You joined your father. He was picking fruit uh, in the fields, and you were working with him in the San Joaquin Valley. And uh, it was very different than the idyllic place that you lived in Mexico. Uh, tell us about your experience as you came to America. 
Well, I didn't want to come to America. I know that's difficult to to probably believe, but I, I feel like my idyllic life was in Mexico. My father was a guest worker, part of the Bracero program of the 1940s and 50s, when the United States, uh, there was a shortage of men. Many of them were up to fighting wars. So they needed... Uh, it needed people to come to the United States to help, and my father was one of them. He was 17 years old when he arrived in the United States. And every other week, like clockwork, he would send us part of his paycheck. And so we had a small little store back in Durango. Uh, we felt like you know, this was the ideal life, a uh, uh, town of about a 1,000 people. Everybody kind of knew you, knew you, knew your name. And then suddenly uh, we get the letters that say, hey, my, my boss does not want to let me go back to Mexico every, every Christmas because he's afraid that uh, I may not come back to the United States. So he's offering us this great opportunity to legalize. And I remember you know, kind of uh, kicking and screaming uh, when I left Mexico, thinking, why do we have to go to to this new country for greater opportunities? Obviously, I was a I was a five year old kid moving to to uh, Ciudad Juarez, and then at the age of six, we finally left for California. Um, you know, Larry, one of the things that always struck me was my father had sent us a postcard, um, and I didn't realize at the time that this was a postcard of the of the capital of California. So, as we're heading north my brothers would would say, are we there yet? Are we there yet? And I would look at the card and I'd say, no, you know, the houses doesn't look the same. Um, so you can imagine my disappointment when we uh, arrived in the San Joaquin Valley and we're living at a trailer house surrounded by melon fields uh, and living, you know, I remember there were mice and rats all over the place. So that was our introduction to, to the United States. Um, Obviously, I think things certainly got a lot better after that. They got a lot better for you. You went to work ultimately as a journalist for the Wall Street Journal. Uh, Now the Dallas newspaper you have reported on and been concerned about immigration and the border for the longest time. And how different is the reporting on these things today, given the current climate and environment, than it might have been even 10, 15, 20 years ago? That's a great question. I mean, my big story, my first big story for the Wall Street Journal was covering amnesty. This is during the uh, President Reagan era, uh, late 1980s. And there was a sense that, uh, you know, amnesty was going to solve the immigration problem. Uh, it, uh, it it basically took people, as, as the slogan back then said, you know, took people out of the shadows. Um, and then you saw this interesting thing happening that, that I don't think we understood the magnitude at the time. And, and that's kind of what Homeland tries to draw on, is you, you started seeing people becoming legalized, and then they started uh, bringing in their families and legalizing them. And suddenly the circle of migration, the, the, the people who, like my father, were going back and forth between Mexico and the United States, that suddenly stopped because uh, security on, on the border began. Uh, to take effect. And so more and more uh, Mexicans uh, began populating communities, not just you know throughout the Southwest, but increasingly in the Midwest, which had a, had a history, but not to the degree that uh, you know the numbers that we see today. Uh, the Southeast, the Northeast, uh, places like uh, New York, Connecticut, uh, where you saw a big population coming in from Puebla and other parts of Mexico. Uh, even Vermont, uh, you see uh, immigrants coming in from from Chiapas and other places. Mm-hmm. So that that changed a lot. The, uh, the, 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 it really reshaped the United States. As a reporter today, when you cover these issues, I mean, obviously there's, there's a lot more division. There's much more of a nativist uh, view. Um, I'm Mexican American, a proud American these days, but I mean, I'm. I'm from both countries. Anytime you write a story, you're, you're sure to get uh, slammed by, by you know, many of these anti-immigrant uh, uh, followers or, or, or people who don't believe that uh, migration is good for this country. So it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a, chi- uh, a sea change, if you will, um, from, from the 1980s to, to the present day. I, mean, I try to tell people it's, uh, it's 
for, you know, in some ways, it's the experience of the Irish, uh, of the Italians, uh, and now it's it's the Mexican migration, and, and we're, we're all in it together. Why is it said to be different? I mean, why do people forget that a lot of those folks who came back in the waves of Italians and Irish and others, that maybe they didn't have all their papers. Why do we have this idyllic view that everybody was coming across so uh, effortlessly and appropriately with all the right documentation? Well, that, I mean, as you know, that that didn't happen. I mean, in, in the 18, in, in 1800s, I mean, people just, many of them came just across without the, the papers, without those documents. But I think it's a it's a bigger question. It's a, it's a bigger issue in, in the United States today. Uh, it's fear of the unknown. It's it's fear of the demographic changes that are that are taking place that are sweeping the country. And obviously, Mexicans make for a good punching bag. You know, uh, if you live on the border, uh, I tell my friends, if you live on the border, you you feel like a piñata. Uh, they just you know they hit you and hit you and hit you because in part I think it's um, it, it's it's low hanging fruit i mean uh, mexican americans have yet to really become the big uh, powerful voting bloc uh and and so it's easy to, to sort of punch him and punch him i think uh then candidate now president uh trump realized that and it worked uh marvelously for him i think it's worked for a lot of politicians uh, in the 1990s and, and 2000s you know when when you needed someone to target uh security the border um, was the obvious place to go, and then you saw your 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 points, your your polling points go up, and that's something that that's that's continued over the years. Uh, uh, my hope is that uh, more and more people, you know, get out and and register like the like the Irish, like the Italians, and form their own uh, voting blocks, whether it's for Republicans, Independents, or Democrats. But I think. Their voices need to be heard. I mean, they need to stop being, as I say in the book, you know, bears in hibernation. But why is it that so many people say, well, there are generations of Mexicans who've come across who have not been acculturated to the American society and that they live apart and aside when, in fact, there are so many people, I think politicians and others, other than, say, a judge or a Joe Arpaio and some of the other extremists, who recognize how indivisible the Mexican culture and the Southwest culture is in places like Texas, Arizona, New Mexico. I mean, it's it's in my own family, Larry. I, I have a hard time finding the younger generations speaking anything but English <laughs> or, or watching anything on television. I mean, the assimilation process is so powerful anywhere in the United States that... Uh, yeah, I'm always begging the younger generation, please keep some of your Spanish so that, so that you can talk to the older generation, your grandparents and so forth. Um, it's, 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 uh, if you go to Mexico, uh, it's hard to find a place that doesn't speak English anymore. I mean, this is a, a, an economic, cultural integration that's taken place over the last 30 years that uh, at the end of the day, both countries are beginning to look and feel and sound a lot more like each other. But you never know it with the conversation. When you saw Donald Trump coming down that escalator in 2015, and some of his first words were that some are murderers, some are rapists, some are good people. I mean, you as a Mexican-American and a writer and a journalist, how did that hit you? Like a, a gut check and punch? It was a huge punch. Um, I kept hoping maybe he's not talking about me, you know. Uh, but yeah, you, I, I thought of the sacrifice that so many, many generations have made. I mean, so many Mexicans since the 30s, the 20s, the 50s, you know, have made to build this country to, to, to add their sweat and, and, and add their, uh, as we say in Mexico, add their ganas to, to try to build and be part of, of, of this great country. And so that, that was a huge slap in the face, you know. Uh, I, I thought of my, of my own parents. Uh, who, in, you know, uh, Trump, I think, has had such an effect that uh, for a while they began to question their own sacrifice. You know, was it worth leaving Mexico? Was it worth taking taking you guys away from Mexico? And I keep telling my parents, I keep reminding them that, that I believe, I continue to believe that, that our values, that, that our beliefs as, as, as Americans 
uh, is still greater than the moment that we're living in. I mean, I still believe in, in the greater greater side of this country. Uh, but it is hard to, to see the older generations, uh, you know, not just then candidate Trump, but I think since then on a daily basis, I mean, you, you're, you're insulted, you're humiliated. Uh, it's very difficult. And it's not just Mexicans. I mean, I think it started as a Mexican. It was a great campaign tactic. Um, it worked for him. But now I think it's any minority in this country, or African Americans, uh, Asians, etc., uh, Middle Easterns especially, who are who are under the attack. But I think it's also a wake up call again for people to say, you know what, uh, we have to be counted. We have to step up to to the plate and and um, and do our part. Well, if you look at a recent Harvard-Harris poll, it shows a couple of things as to what Americans are thinking. They don't want to break up families, and they really hated what they saw going on on the border, and yet they don't really want to break up the Immigration and Customs Enforcement Agency either. They oppose open borders and closed borders because they realize we need workers coming from outside. They reject, in many ways, the sanctuary cities, but they also don't want a wall. I mean, there are many conflicts in our own thinking. Well, this book tries to, <laughs> tries to really look at, the, at, at this narrative arc, you know, over uh, the history of our country. The, it's, the, the, it's rife with the contradictions, you know, of they love you one day, they hate you one, and the next day. I, as a reporter, I travel across the country and I ask people, uh, you know, both for the book, but also for my work at the Dallas Morning News, uh, about their feelings about the wall, uh, their feelings about, you know, immigrants coming in. And everywhere I go, people say, you know what, the wall just doesn't make sense. Um, and, and we're seeing more and more labor shortages. We need more immigrants. But yet, when I talk to experts, you know, on the field, they say that's what they say. But once they're in the in the the, the voting uh, booth, something else happens. And I think again, it's it's fear of the, the of the unknown. I mean, I live on the border. I live uh, in El Paso, Texas. I, I can, I'm talking to you right now, and I can look across and I can literally see the wall. <laughs> and that's really the metaphor for uh, of, of this fear that people have. You know, they they don't know what's happening. And they don't even know that some of the U.S. communities along the border, every U.S. community that I know, are some of the safest anywhere in the country. Um, and why don't they understand that? that? Why don't they know that story? Because I think we, we live in a very divided time. I mean, we, we live at a time when, when you, if you want to watch uh, uh, one side of the story, you, you turn into, you know, uh, this channel, or that channel, or that cable station, that cable station. I mean, it's, it's a very divisive time. I saw it uh, as, as, as a reporter, but I never thought it was going to get to this point. And, you know, in the end, you think, you know, the demographics will eventually uh, win at the end of the day or, or we'll see the real side of America. But I think uh, we're, we're in for, I mean, we're seeing a very, very dark side of this country because people, are, again, are afraid of, of what's to come or what's already here in their own neighborhoods. I mean, you wake up... Uh, and, and, and you look around and, and people are not the same color you are. They don't speak the same language or they speak several languages. And I think uh, for a lot of Americans, that's, that's a, it's, a, it's a fearful time. It's a scary time. And it's, it's a very, very uh, disappointing time because we, we should try to be building bridges, not walls. Absolutely. You, uh, of course, are somebody who understands the border and you live on the border and you consider your writing to be most important as it relates to the border. So when I think of one of the richest countries in the world or the richest country with one of the poorer countries in the world and they share a border, uh, people have to understand, I think, how permeable <laughs> that is and the fact that, in fact, people who live on the other side would want to come over if there were economic opportunities. But I always said when I was on a radio program where many of the listeners were much more conservative than I was, that they were actually encouraged to come over by employers. Uh, and there were people who were unscrupulous, who didn't care. And they said, if you've got 10 guys who can work as hard as you do, I'll take them all. And so I never blamed the individual. It's the process and fix the 
the system to get us the guest workers or the visas that we need. Uh, I don't understand why we're blaming the individual to the extent that the system has not kept up with the demand. You know, Larry, as, as growing up in the San Joaquin Valley, I always remember the employer, the renter coming in after the hard working day and talking to my parents and saying, by the way, do you know more people, more relatives, more friends back in Durango? I'm from a little town called San Luis de Cordero, Durango. Can you pass the word out? We need more people. We need more workers. And they did. I mean, I came to the United States very homesick, very lonely, uh, missing my friends and relatives. And suddenly, you know, many of them are, are there living next to me or living in, in the same house. Uh, that's that's story has happened generation after generation after generation but guess what that story is ending there are no more there are, there aren't that many mexicans coming across and as much as they say you know we, we have to stop the mexicans from coming across the border that's not happening there are, it's it's record low numbers what, what we're seeing today and as, as a as a consequence you're seeing more and more labor shortages across the country more and more people, when I interview them, will say, hey, what is happening to the Mexicans? Why aren't they coming? We're seeing many more, more refugees. We're seeing more Central Americans, but we're not seeing the Mexicans. Why aren't they coming? Because back in the 70s, families had an average of you know seven, eight kids per family. Now it's two. And you're also seeing not really great paying jobs in, in Mexico, but more jobs in Mexico. And crossing across, you know, crossing, making making the attempt to cross the border is much, much more difficult because you have cartels who control these routes. Um, so on the Mexican side, it's more difficult. On the U.S. side, you have a lot more security, um, and you have a very unwelcoming environment. All those messages uh, have, have gotten through to all these communities across Mexico, whether it's Guanajuato or whether it's San Luis Potosí, Michoacán, Durango, etc., so people think once, twice, three times, you know, do I make the risk? Do I, do I make the sacrifice? Or should I just work at that company that doesn't pay that much, but at least I have a t- steady employment and I don't have to leave? Leaving Mexico has not been easy, I, you know, for a lot of people. It's always been a necessity. But I think Americans will, you know, are beginning to understand that Mexicans aren't coming across and they're beginning to miss uh, their work. I mean, we're seeing more Mexicans coming in, uh, more middle class, you know, people who are are generating jobs, but not the worker, not the not the person who was, you know, was out of the fields or, or do construction or taking care of your lawn or your, or your family. Uh, that profile is fading. And by the way, I do think that uh, I owe you on behalf of the American public, uh, you know, an apology, anybody who's of Mexican descent, because I think a lot of people, you know, don't look at Mexico as the rich, vibrant, cultural uh, place that it is. My sister and brother-in-law are spending two months in Mexico, and they are just... Where are they? Uh, they are now you've got me, uh, I've got, uh, uh, the name will come back to me, but they're in, uh, oh, San Miguel, uh, Dayende, is it? San Miguel Dayende. Yeah. And they love it. And they're finding such richness and cultural diversity and a lot of transplants from the United States and other places. But my point is that we tend to pigeonhole, oh, this is a poor country and there's nothing of value there for us. When in fact there is such richness and joy and great great people and food and culture and customs. It's a very, very vibrant, friendly country, welcoming country. Uh, sometimes I walk around Mexico and I think, ah, you know, this country feels so hopeful. Uh, and and I, I think that's why I live on the border, because I can go back and forth. I couldn't live without one or the other. I mean, I have to be on both sides. But there is that sense in Mexico, especially these days and, and these very difficult days in, in the United States. When you're in Mexico, and and it's a country that's uh, that's transforming itself. It's a country that's finding its own identity. I mean, for many many years, it was trying to emulate the United States. But one of the things you hear more and more is, especially in you know during uh, these days of this uh, administration, is we have to forge our own identity. We have to be our own country, and I think that's that's healthy, uh, very healthy for for Mexico because, as you say, it, it is a Culturally, it's a rich country. There's so many resources. Um, you know, it's it's a country that has a, a new sort of a 
economic uh, model and, and a new uh, it's a new democracy is still finding kind of find its uh, rule of law. And, and I think when that happens, uh, it's really going to take off. Well, you remind us, as we are in the midst of renegotiating NAFTA, and we were told just today that there's some progress uh, with that, but that Mexico didn't really want NAFTA. Can you explain to us, as somebody who looks across the borders, what the impact of NAFTA really has been on Mexico and the United States? Well, I mean, there is the economic side. You know, uh, you see a lot more American companies, foreign companies in, in Mexico. I mean, that did happen. You saw a lot of displacement of, of uh, farmers and, and business owners in, in throughout the country, especially small farmers. And that's, that was one of the reasons why they were so hesitant about, uh, about entering the, this whole NAFTA pact, because they knew they couldn't compete with the United States. So as a result, you saw a lot of people displaced. A lot of people ended up leaving for the United States. But I think it, it, it also sort of provided the, the guardrail for a new U.S.-Mexico relationship, you know, a deeper integration, deeper uh, economic uh, uh, dependency between both sides, uh, more cooperation between both sides. So, so there's the economy, but I think it really goes beyond the economy. And I think, uh, you know, with the, with the reaction in the last couple of years in, in, in the United States, I mean, there are many, many more Mexicans who are questioning, yes, NAFTA helped us become a much more modern country, but is this really what we want to become? I mean, don't we, should we depend more on, on each other, on ourselves as Mexicans, than always look to the North for, for help and, and, for, and, and as a model? Uh, it's it's a healthy debate that uh, that Mexicans are are, are having, uh, but I think you know many of them know that it's going to be difficult uh, to maintain the the uh, the environment that we live in, and so we have a, a new president was just elected July first. He takes office on December first. So there is this there is this period of you know first of all why did you why did Mexico elect a left leaning more of a nationalist uh, president? I think. Part of the answer is we want to forge our own destiny. When asked to choose uh, the best way to deter illegal immigration, more Americans seem to cite verification of the legal status of the individual at the workplace than any other option. And then by a vast majority, we want the dreamers to be recognized. And then there's this four pillar strategy that the Trump administration at least has put forward. Is this a basis for more comprehensive reform? I think it's a it's a start. I mean, the the whole employment debate has been around since I can remember, and yet uh, it's never really been enforced. I mean, the, part of the whole amnesty in, in 1986 was we're going to make em, employers part of uh, of the enforcement. That never happened. I mean, I was working at the Wall Street Journal, and we were looking, and there was so much pressure on the part of employers against the government that uh, it, it really never had a chance. Um, and the dreamers, I think that, uh, yes, I mean, most Americans recognize the, the, the importance of these dreamers. And I mean, we're already seeing uh, one of the, the most recent stories I did was on, on the deportation of so many people, including some dreamers who have ended up in Mexico. Uh, I mean, these are people who were educated, who grew up in, in the United States. Who the, the reason I found them in Mexico is that I was in a neighborhood and all I could hear was, was English coming, coming from these people. And I thought, wait a minute. They're, they seem very, very Mexican, and I went up to them, and these were people who grew up in, in the U.S., were educated in the U.S., who had jobs, who created jobs in the U.S. Um, and, and you know, nowadays we 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 we're beginning to see communities that are nicknaming themselves Little L.A. or Little Chicago or Little Dallas throughout the country. I mean, that's something that's new, and and uh, it's kind of I think. Uh, hopefully in, in, in the future, you know, uh, push Mexico to become a much more of a forward, forward-looking forward country. The book is called Homelands, Four Friends, Two Countries, and the Fate of the Great Mexican-American Migration. At the end of your book, you talk about yourself as something of a broken-down bridge, but a bridge nonetheless. Uh, is that how you see yourself and explain it? I've always saw myself, as, uh, especially as a journalist, that my stories would help both sides understand 
each other, you know, by writing these very complicated issues that people would uh, would hopefully uh, look at each other and say, okay, I, I understand my neighbor better. Uh, I understand their aspirations, whether it's from the Mexican side or from the American side. But what we've seen these, these days, I mean, it, it does make you question, you know, uh, exactly what kind of bridge was I trying to build? I mean, it obviously didn't work. Um, and it just makes you want to work harder and, and maybe try harder and maybe try to get more voices. I mean, one, one of the reasons why I, I wanted to work in the United States after, you know, more than two decades in Mexico was to try to understand this country a lot better. And, and it took me, I mean, in, in writing the book, it took me through journeys all across the United States uh, to try to get a better sense of what this country is going through right now. Um, yes, I, I feel like a broken bridge, but, uh, but I'm still standing. I mean, I'm still there, and I'm still trying to find ways to hopefully bring these two countries and more, you know, bring more of a, of a neighborly environment to these two countries. Well, geography is destiny, and you're not going anywhere, the Mexican country. We're not going anywhere, the United States. So when you look at our values, our principles, our ideals, uh, have you been shaken in your resolve that America is or can be a really good place and an accepting and welcoming home uh, for people across the globe, including Mexico? I have good days and I have bad days, Larry. There are days when I wonder, I didn't realize this democracy could be so uh, so vulnerable uh and then there are days when when i'm again i feel very hopeful a, a, about this country and about the fate of our two countries uh, but i think like many americans i mean you know you you're you're will you wake up and you go home after work and you realize you know where are we going tomorrow um it is it, it is that difficult but i think it also it's also forcing uh, Americans to really re-identify or 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 find a, a, a new identity for this country and, and for ourselves and for our future, and and that's it's, I think it's a healthy debate if 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 we keep it as a debate and and, and it's healthy. And sometimes there's so much rhetoric that I think the, that debate gets lost in that. Well, I want to thank you so much for sharing your thoughts with us today. Alfredo Corchado, I encourage you to read this book, Homelands, Four Friends, Two Countries, and the Fate of the Great Mexican-American Migration. Just an honor to have you on the program today. Thank you so much, Larry. I appreciate it.